as a family historian, I know that there are certain building blocks that you can use to research your ancestors. After 1837, you've got birth, marriage and death certificates. Before 1837, you're looking at parish records, baptisms, marriages, burials. There are actually quite a lot of marriages in Pride and Prejudice. So I thought that today I would have a look at that from the family historian's perspective. By the end of the novel, our main characters, Elizabeth Bennet and Fitzwilliam Darcy, Jane Bennet and Charles Bingley, are all married. And there are actually quite a few other weddings that have taken place over the course of the novel. But without having to necessarily know a great deal about the laws and customs of marriage in the Regency period, just by having a closer look at some of the details in the text, you can actually learn one or two things about the history and customs and laws that surrounded marriage in Jane Austen's England. Today I'm going to have a look at some of those. Towards the end of the novel, Mrs Bennet finds out that her daughter Elizabeth is engaged to Darcy and her first reaction is that you must and should be married by a special license. But I don't think that was really all that necessary. A special license basically means that you're asking special permission to get married from the Archbishop of Canterbury and it's often if you want to get married in a church that isn't your own parish church, it might be a cathedral or something like that, somewhere that you don't have an obvious direct connection to and you need basically you need special permission and a very expensive license that today will cost you £325, so we can imagine what it would have cost in the Regency period, something comparable to that. In Elizabeth's case, I would argue, she didn't really need one, because traditionally weddings took place in the bride's parish church. Elizabeth and Jane apparently live at home at Longbourn until the day they get married. There's no indication that they go off and live with their aunt and uncle gardener in London or anything like that. There is absolutely no reason at all that they couldn't have gone down the usual route of going to church on three successive Sundays, having the bands read and um, allowing people a chance to object if they wish to. I think basically Mrs Bennet just wants the special licence so that she can boast to her friends about how much her daughter's weddings cost and of course the fact that they are marrying two men who in modern terms would be multi-millionaires. That's why she wants the special license, is because it's expensive. She just wants all the bells and whistles for her daughter's weddings and that's the only reason. There's no purpose at all in that special license in the case of Jane and Elizabeth. It just is not necessary. Wickham did not succeed in eloping with Georgiana Darcy and her brother surmises that the whole reason that Wickham ever tries to elope with Georgiana in the first place is because as a close family friend, somebody who's basically been brought up within the Darcy family in fact, he must have known, he had to have had an idea that she was going to be given a dowry of £30,000 when she got married. Legally, what belonged to Georgiana became her husband's when she got married and that's what he's got his eye on, he wants the money. Georgiana is 15 at this point, she is barely out of school. So although her father has probably made provisions to cover her education, which is something we're going to talk about in a later video, Darcy, her brother, has probably got absolutely no reason at all to suppose that he even needs to give the first thought to his little sister getting married. She's 15 years old. Why would he? He thinks this kind of thing is years away. But Georgiana is not the only young woman to have had a dowry. 
even the relatively middle class it, Mrs. Bennet, her, Miss Gardiner as she was, she had a dowry too. We can infer therefore that probably her sister Mrs. Phillips also was given a dowry when she married Mr. Phillips. Chapter 50 tells us that 24 years earlier, Mr. Bennet, probably his father-in-law, Mr. Gardiner Senior, drew up a marriage settlement that provided £5,000 for Mrs. Bennet and any of the children that came of that marriage after Mr. Bennet died. From that, I'm going to infer that that £5,000 must have been Mrs. Bennet's dowry. Nothing is actually set up or mentioned in the novel regarding how this sum of money gets portioned up. There's Mrs. Bennet and the five girls, so it's not a nice, neat five-way split, is it? It's a, a six-way split. And it's probably because at that point in time, the newlyweds just had no idea how many children they were going to have. Mr. and Mrs. Bennet could have had one child that lived, they could have had ten children, they could have had the son they never had. But as an attorney, Mr. Gardiner Senior, Mrs. Bennet's father, would understand about these matters. He would have known how to draw a marriage settlement up properly, and clearly he did have the sense to make proper arrangements. So when we move to forward in time, to the point where Lydia is getting married, in chapter 49, Mr. Gardiner asks Mr. Bennett's permission to let somebody called Haggerston, who was probably his solicitor or financial advisor of some kind, that's the inference, I think, that Haggerston should draw up a marriage settlement for Lydia. Marriage settlements weren't usually the kind of thing that you drew up in advance. They would often be done maybe a few months, a few weeks before the wedding. It's like the, the final preparations. It's not something that you would do as a random thing. You would organise it properly. You would arrange it close to the time when the marriage was going to take place. Um, it wasn't a theoretical thing. It was an actual arrangement involving real people, the real bride and groom to formalise the coming wedding. And of course this whole thing then goes back to the issue of the wife's property and money becoming her husband's when they marry. I suspect that knowing what Wickham is like at this point, Mr Gardiner wants Mr Haggerston to add some clever legal clause, and there must have been a way to do it, to prevent Wickham from accessing whatever dowry Mr Bennett lets Lydia have. Maybe he does it by saying that the dowry has to be invested and all that can be paid out to Lydia and Wickham during the marriage is the annual interest. It might be something of that nature. But what is also interesting is that when writing to Mr Bennett to let him know how these preparations are going on, Mr Gardiner also asks Mr Bennett to promise that Lydia will get her equal share of the £5,000 that was secured amongst your children um, after uh, the decease of Mr and Mrs Bennett, so it's, it's the children's inheritance basically. So let us suppose that this £5,000 is indeed Mrs Bennett's dowry because it all matches up with the information being given and that she and Mr Bennett have been married about 24 years at this point in the novel. For the sake of argument, using the family tree in my previous video, I am going to say their wedding date was some point in the year 1788. From my research using the website Measuring Worth, which is an excellent price comparison tool if you want to find out what historical prices are worth in today's money. In 1788, the interest rates for anything that you invested long term was around about 4.01%. This is where we get a bit financial and technical, bear with me. By 1812, that had risen to 5.08, so it had gone up a little bit, but it did fluctuate over the 24 years, as interest rates do. They certainly do. They even do that today. They're not static. The peak interest rate during that period was actually in 1798, when 
it hit an astonishing 5.94%. I'd bite your hand off for that sort of interest rate. Right? Yeah, absolutely. Yes, please bring it to me. It's, I will invest. <laughs> Definitely. And had Mr. Bennett been a bit more canny, maybe he would have done the same. The average interest rate actually comes out at 4.62%. So for simplicity's sake, we're going to use that as our benchmark. If Mr. Bennett had invested that £5,000 at a fixed interest rate of 4.62% in when he theoretically married in 1788, he would have made £1,266.16 shillings and a slight oddment, which is not easy to convert from digital to old, literal old money, within the first five years. It would have increased by 25% again. That's a really good return. By the time of Lydia's birth, which I reckon to be about the summer of 1796, the £5,000 would have been worth £7,176.02. and two shillings. If you split it that way, even at that point, when Lydia's still a baby, so that you're accounting for Mrs Bennet and the five girls, everybody is going to get £1,196. That's very reasonable. So by the time the novel opens, because we're coming forward in time 15 years now, in what I am going to take to be autumn of 1811, the original £5,000 would have been earning around about £625 in interest every year. And of course, if it, you leave it there and you don't spend the interest, it's just going to increase and increase and increase. So when Lydia elopes with Wickham the following summer, the investment would have been worth £14,000 776 pounds and a shilling almost the same as Darcy and Bingley's combined annual income of course they've got much bigger fortunes that's why they've got huge income but that would have been no inconsiderable sum split that six ways and you are going to get 2,462 pounds 15 shillings and about sixpence for each of the girls and Mrs. Bennett. That would have been the sensible thing to do. That's probably the kind of thing that Mr. Darcy Senior would have done because I assume that his wife, as a, as a, a noble woman, she would have been given a, a decent dowry um, and he would have been intelligent enough and astute enough to invest it. Had Mr. Bennett done the same thing, he would have been in a much better financial position when Lydia elopes with Wickham. Of course, he didn't bother to do that. I think his philosophy is, it'll be all right, it'll do tomorrow, I don't, I'm not going to think about it. I think what he did was to probably just put Mrs Bennett's £5,000 aside, it's the equivalent of putting it in a box under your bed, and did absolutely nothing else with it. He didn't do anything to invest it, he didn't do anything to increase its value, he didn't think about how it might support his wife and children in the future, he just left it as it was. What is even worse is that chapter 50 opens by telling us that not only did Mr Bennett not invest the dowry as Darcy's father probably did with Mrs Darcy's, as Bingley Senior probably did with Mrs Bingley's, but that he very often wished before this period of his life that instead of spending his whole income he had laid by an annual sum for the better provision of his children and of his wife if she survived him. So we can infer that Mr Bennett lived within his means but only just. Had he put a stop to the continual presence in money which passed to Lydia through her mother's hands, which, as I noted in the previous video, he estimated at a ludicrously expensive, almost £100 a year, he would have been much better off. He could have taken that £100 a year very easily, obviously he didn't desperately need it, invested it, he'd have been in a much better position. If you're wondering what £100 would get you in the Regency period, 
I found an approximate comparison in a newspaper advert. The Lancaster Gazette for the 18th of August 1804, so this is like seven years before Pride and Prejudice is set, about nine years before the book is published, and there's an advert for a schoolmaster to teach at Newborough School near Ormskirk in Lancashire. The successful candidate is promised a house and eight acres of land and a salary of £50 a year. So Mr Bennett is basically standing by and letting his wife and daughter fritter away enough money to employ and comfortably house two schoolmasters. That is something to make me think. But enough of Mr Bennett's regrets. Why don't we look at a bit more about the cause of what makes him so regretful in that summer as Lydia's marriage is approaching. Let us talk about the wedding itself. This is a marriage that is arranged for no better reason than to make their elopement look slightly more respectable, as is pointed out quite clearly in the novel as Mr Collins glories in reminding Lydia's sisters when he comes to visit and condole with them. She will be, you know, she'll be a social pariah, she will be a disgrace and because she's a disgrace then people are going to look at the other girls, they're going to say Jane, Elizabeth, Mary, Kitty, they are all the sisters of that Lydia Bennett who ran, was allowed to run away to Brighton and eloped and was brought back home and who knows what could have happened. She could have come back pregnant, who knows? It, it would not have worked out well socially for the family. The marriage is just to make things look a bit more cosmetically acceptable. But silly as Lydia is, the description of her wedding day in chapter 51 does actually show an awareness of the laws governing marriage, which is quite surprising and ironic, I think, that one of the least serious characters in the novel actually <laughs> gives us some information that we can relate to in a family history kind of context. Because long before Lydia would have been born, in 1754, in fact probably before her parents were even born, Hardwick's Marriage Act was passed. And this was trying to clamp down on clandestine marriages and irregular marriages. It was introduced by Lord Hardwick. And all marriages in England and Wales had to take place in an Anglican church. They had to be conducted by an ordained minister and an actual proper clergyman. And in this case, this would be Anglican because it wasn't a good time to be Catholic in England in the 1700s. At least not till the later part of the century. If you were under 21, this is relevant to Lydia, you had to have permission from a parent or a guardian. Clergymen who didn't trouble themselves to get this permission were risking 14 years transportation. Now this is something I didn't know. Transportation had only come in quite recently when Australia was discovered, so you would be exiled to, you know, a land thousands of miles away, you're never going to come back. That's quite a risk to take. The entry in the marriage register also had to be signed, or it might be crossed if people, the bridegroom or the witnesses were illiterate, by the minister, the bride, the groom and two witnesses. This is what was required by law. But sometimes, and I have come across this occasionally, more than two witnesses would have signed. And actually Lydia tells us that the only people at her wedding, there were no bridesmaids, no friends of Wickham's from the army, which she was most disappointed about. The only people there are her aunt and uncle, Mr and Mrs Gardiner, and Darcy, who was probably basically come along doing the equivalent of waving a shotgun around behind Wickham to make sure he actually married her. So we can make a pretty good guess from that about whose signatures went on to that marriage register. 
I was always under the impression that Hardwick's Act also said that you had to get married between 8am and 12pm, otherwise the marriage was not legally binding. But actually this did not become law until 1836, and it has changed since. Lydia also reveals that an unexpected caller for Mr and Mrs Gardiner risks them being late to church, and that if we were beyond the hour, we could not be married all day. So the law doesn't actually say they've got to be married between 8am and 12 noon at this point in history. So I wonder why she's so concerned. I wonder whether the vicar who married them actually appreciated the circumstances, understood that it was a bit of a rushed wedding, a, a, a marriage of absolute necessity, and the vicar was quite disapproving of these immoral young people and so he was really reluctant to conduct the ceremony and basically thought I am not going to put myself out to do your wedding at a later point in time, this is the time I've got free this morning, this is the only hour you can have, take it or leave it. I wouldn't be surprised. But interestingly, although weddings traditionally do take place in the bride's parish, Lydia tells us that her wedding was at St Clement's Church because Wickham's lodgings were in this parish. St Clement's is just north of London Bridge and it's implied that they married on Monday the 16th of August which is two weeks exactly after Lydia goes to stay with Mr and Mrs Gardiner which only leaves two Sundays for the bands to be read, not the three that were required by law. So on these grounds I suspect that Lydia married by licence. Theoretically, the parish register for their marriage, if it existed, might have looked something like this. However, this is open to a bit of interpretation. I've seen at least one source which suggests that Mr Gardiner's letter is actually incorrectly dated and that the wedding date was in fact the 31st of August, which was a Tuesday in 1812, not a Monday as Lydia tells us. If that is the case, we don't really need to worry about the time being too short for the bands to be called because that gives her plenty of time to have had the bands read on three successive Sundays. It's entirely possible that she could have got married by bands in that case. So have you noticed any other little details relating to the laws and customs surrounding marriage in Pride and Prejudice? Or have you seen any in any other of Jane Austen's novels? In view of the fact that legally speaking anything that a wife brought to a marriage became her husband's. Do you think it's reasonable to say that Mr Bennett should have monitored the money that Mrs Bennett was handing out to Lydia far more closely because after all what was hers had become his so really she should have asked him permission except that we know only too well that Mr Bennett has sort of retreated into his library to hide from the women in his family. Has he effectively given Mrs Bennett free reign where a stricter husband would have been much more controlled, um, much more careful about managing the household finances and wanting to account for every last penny? And finally, which date do you favour for Lydia and Wickham's wedding day? Is it the 16th? Is it the 31st? Is there another interpretation? I would very much like to hear your thoughts. <laughs>